In 1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuler, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Schuler will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. Good morning, dear friends. Welcome to the Hour of Power and thanks for your support to us. We have good news for you. With the effects from January the 6th, 2018, the broadcast time of Our Power on TBP Pearl Channel, every Sunday changed to 8 a.m. in the morning, and every Saturday continue at 10 a.m. in the morning. Stay tuned. Our program is bilingual broadcast, other than original English. If your TV is equipped with night camp facility, you can watch Our Power in Cantonese. In the book of Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The greatest human need is to love others and to be loved. To understand love truly is to understand what life is all about. Today, Pastor Bobby Schiller talks about love. And he particularly shares on what Christian love is. Christian love is the kind of love we really need. In the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 10, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Christian love is proactive. It is empathetic and caring. Pastor Bobby Schiller uses the story of the Good Samaritan to teach us the golden rules. Love your neighbor as yourself. Lord Jesus took on himself the nature of a man to know our pain, to know our suffering, to die on the cross and to cleanse our sin and conquer death. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Because of the example of Lord Jesus, who showed us what Christian love is, that we can love our neighbors, our friends, and even our enemies or competitors. Christian love does not walk away when being offended. Christian love ceases to understand. Christian love does not cut people out when there is anger or disagreement. Christian love means we care. So let's be brave to love. We love because God loved us first. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome, church family. The Lord has a word for you today. Would you turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you or give them a big hug and say, God loves you and so do I. We're so glad you're here and uh, so honored that you're here. God invited you to this place and you said yes, you came. And uh, I think he's gonna bless you for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
that you are here. We thank you that you're going to do great things for everyone who comes with an open heart and says, Lord, I have this need. Help me. So, Lord, we thank you that in Jesus' name you'll break every chain. That you're going to encourage people. That you're going to give us the miracle we're looking for. We're trusting in you, Lord. We thank you. You're a good God. And we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord found in Romans and Matthew. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Love is the summation of everything God asks of us. We are living the best life there is as we love those around us. Amen.
Will you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we delight as your people gathered here together. We delight in you. We delight that you look to us and call us your beloved. You call us children, Father. We join with all of the heavenly host and say, Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. All heaven and earth reveals your glory. Lord, we pray for our congregation and all the needs that are present here, Lord. We are praying in faith and we are believing that chains are being broken. We believe in miracles, Lord. We believe that bondage will be no more and that your spirit is here and alive and active in our hearts. Lord, set this church on fire for you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Lord, we worship you and we pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. First John chapter 3 tells us, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I love that last line. Let us not love with words or speech, but in action and truth. We talk a lot about faith in action, love in action. You've heard Bobby say, if you have a need, plant a seed, or talk about doing something bold for God, stepping out in boldness and in and, and your faith. And I think the same is true of our generosity, doing something bold for God, doing something in action. 
So I challenge you to do something bold, something maybe you've never done before with a friend or a neighbor or a coworker, an organization, your church, anything. Do something bold for God. Put that, put that faith in action for God. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here with us on Hour of Power, and that's our church welcoming you. We want you to know we believe in you. You're a part of our church, even if you're in Hong Kong or Holland or Australia or wherever you are, we want you to know we love you and your family to us. And if you live here in Southern California, come down. Come worship with us. We want to meet you. This is a great community of joy. We love people here, and uh, we'd love to love on you. Come down here. We'd love to meet you. All right, friends, something we do every Sunday. Would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving? I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I'm the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus. 
can share his love with the world. Amen, you can have a seat. Okay, this morning we're going to talk about love. And it's hard to talk about love because I feel very often the word love is used so much and so generally and, and so, spoken of so vapidly, you know, with, in, an, in an empty, shallow way, that um, I'm, my worry about the sermon today is that it'll be boring, honestly. Like, okay, ho-hum, you got to love people, you got to be a loving person. And I talk about love all the time, so I was a little concerned about that, and, and yet I think that at the heart of it, to understand love truly is to really understand what life is all about, that the greatest human need is to, to love others and to be loved. And the most important person you can love and be loved by is God. And that's what we believe. And that Christ creates a way for that to happen. You model in your life the kind of love the world really needs. Christian love. Your love is proactive. Your love is brave. Your love is the kind of love that the world needs. You're not afraid to lay it all out there. And I'm not talking about just romantic love. I'm talking about friends. I'm even talking about loving your enemies or your competitors or people who disagree with you politically or religiously. I'm proud of you because your love is not segregated or cut off, but it reaches out and in a way is even messy and dangerous, and that's okay. Christian love is proactive. It's empathetic. It's caring. And in some ways, it's simple. It's simple because... It's just as simple as this, you care. You actually care about people. And I want to just affirm that in you today, that you are a loving, Christ-filled person, and when you are a loving person, things get messy, and that's okay. You have not withdrawn your love, your affection, your kindness, your goodness to other people because you've gotten angry, or because people have hurt you, or because you've messed up sometimes. You are a loving, good person and I'm proud of you. You're not judging. You're seeking to understand before you assess. And that's good. That's what the world needs. And I want to affirm in you that God is getting ready to pour out in new ways his love on your life. God's going to open up new windows. He's going to create new opportunity for you. And his love is not going to be just something you kind of feel. You're going to see God working in new ways in your life. And I believe that as you experience that, it's going to push you to love others. It's going to make you feel full of courage, faith, and even safety to, in a trusting way, reach out to love others. Can I get an amen? It's going to happen if you want it. It's coming. So today we're talking about The Narrow Road. And The Narrow Road is a series on how to be energized and alive. I believe that Jesus offered to us uh, a, a way that was, that's difficult, that's narrow, that's hard, that that's, can be treacherous and even dangerous. But he says, if you take that path instead of the easy way, you're going to be filled with so much life. You're going to be overwhelmed with my joy if you just do what I tell you to do. And so the series that we're in now is a study of these key teachings that Jesus gave during his life. And the thing we're going to talk about today is love, particularly in the context of what's known as the golden rule. Who can name the golden rule off the top of their heads? Do unto others, so famous, right? What you'd have them do unto you. So another way that Jesus would say this is love your neighbor as yourself. So this is the golden rule. And what he says is this is the total fulfillment of my law and command. Now, I want to talk a little bit of history because I find this so fascinating. This saying, in a way, was a twist on an older saying. What Jesus said here that's so famous today was actually shocking because he changed the wording of something Uh, that was already common in his day. So there's two characters in the Gospels that a lot of people are familiar with. Kind of a villain and a hero. And any first century reader of the Gospels probably would have known who these two people were. And their names were Hillel. Everybody say Hillel. Hillel's going to be on my right. This is Hillel. Hi, Hillel. Nice to meet you. Hillel the Elder. And Shammai. Everybody say Shammai. Hillel. Shammai. It's a little bit wimpy. I'm going to do it one more time. Hallel? Hallel. Shammai. Shammai. All right, good. So Hallel and Shammai, two educated Jewish men, both of them major influences on Jewish life today. And Hallel lived to be 120, the same age as Moses. 
he was the leader of the Jewish community and built this incredible Jewish school upon which today rabbinic Judaism is built on. He was one of the major influences of a book called the Talmud and the Mishnah. And Hillel the Elder is an incredibly wonderful man. His contemporary Shammai created a different house called the House of Shammai. But they were friends, they were competitors, but they worked together to build a sort of contemporary, for their day, contemporary view of Judaism. And so they were always arguing. Hillel's view of everything was Ju Judaism is meant to be for the peace of the world, the shalom of the world. We're meant to reach out to the world, to be there for other people. Shammai said the purpose of Judaism is holiness, rightness in the sense of separateness. And as they both get older, and they both live to be a pretty ripe old age, they had these sort of two views, and they became the main two influencers and leaders of Jewish thought up until Jesus' day. Shammai is standing here, and Shammai is all about, you know, do all the Torah right, Gentiles stay away. If you're rich, it's because God's blessing you. If it's poor, it's because God's cursing you. Hillel says, no, that's, that's not true. It's, you want to do, you want to follow Torah to the T, but Torah is meant to bring shalom to the world, to reach out to people, right? So it's two very different. One's cut off, one is integrated. So when Jesus is then asked how to inherit eternal life, he says, love your neighbor yourself. Or another place he says, instead of saying, don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do, he says what? Do. Do unto others what you'd have them do unto you. Love one another. Reach out to one another. Reach to others. Don't just segregate. Go to others. Reach out to other people. People need you. Don't just isolate yourself. You need to go to others. And that is Christian love. Both Hillel and Jesus were invoking Leviticus chapter 19. I'm glad you didn't know I was teaching on Leviticus today. You might not have come to church. But this is a good one. It's a good one. It starts with sounding like what Hillel said. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Right? Don't hurt anybody. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Fair enough. Keep them accountable. But then it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And one time, so one Pharisee asked Jesus, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to this Pharisee, well, what do you say? And he says, love the Lord with all my heart and love my neighbor as yourself. Something like that. Love my neighbor, love my neighbor as myself. And Jesus said, do this and you will inherit eternal life, right? Simple enough. But then the Pharisee won't let it sit. Well, he says, well, who's my neighbor? And in response to that question, Jesus tells the famous story of the Good Samaritan. There's a man dying in the road and a bunch of religious people just walk around him and forget about him. But the Samaritan, that is the most unreligious, one of the most rejected people in the group in, the, in the, that day, stops and he's the one who helps the man. In other words, it's the Samaritan who inherits eternal life. It's, and the Samaritan is your neighbor. It's your near dweller. It's not just, it's anyone that's in the 15 feet of space around you. So Christian love is about what you do, it is proactive, it is empathetic, and it's actually quite simple. It means you care. Jesus totally, totally epitomizes Christian love in everything he does. He's proactive. God comes from heaven to us. He doesn't wait for us to go to him. He comes to us. Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. you Jesus, you're my beloved, huh? And so, so God is proactive in his love to us, and he's empathetic. Jesus took on, him, on, his, on himself the nature of a man to know our pain, to know our suffering, and the cross in and of itself is total proactive, empathetic love. It is God, knowing our suffering and our sin, dies to take our place that we can have life. Purging the world of all sin and death in one great act of courage. That's Christian love. You want to know Christian love? Look at the cross. Christian love is not easy. It's not easy to lay down your life for another. But Jesus says to us, no servant is greater than his master. And I've served you, now go and serve one another. And that's what Christian love is. Amen? And you're doing it, and I'm proud of you. See, and that's the thing, is Christian love 
doesn't walk away because it gets offended. Christian love doesn't judge. It seeks to understand. Christian love doesn't cut people out because of offense or anger or disagreement. The only time it cuts out is when there's boundaries. So love, so what is love? What is love? Did anybody else hear it? As soon as I, it echoed. Sorry, I digress. <laughs> what is love? See, I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the reasons that love can be boring is because the answers are so bland. And honestly, hard to understand. Love is very simple for Christians. Love means you care about somebody. It means you care. So I, I once had a guy who, I loved this question. I'm so glad he asked it. And he, he said, Pastor, you always have us turn around and shake hands and say, God loves you and so do I. But I, half the people I'm shaking hands with, I don't know them. How can I say I love you? I mean, I know God loves them, but I don't even know them. How can I love them? And it's a perfect question. I asked him, do you care about the person, even though they're a stranger? If they were hurting, would you help them? If they fell down, would you lift them up? If they were hungry, would you feed them? If they were sad, would you be there for them? Then you love them. You love means you care. It's care for human good. That's why you can love, in, for Christians, in our definition of love, you can love your enemies. You can love people that annoy you. You can love people you don't have happy feelings towards. You can love your enemies. If you have someone who's wounded you, hurt you, is a terrible, nasty person, but you still want the best for them, you love them. It doesn't mean you're not angry. It doesn't mean they don't bother you. It doesn't mean you don't feel wounded. And it doesn't mean you're besties and you're good friends. To love them means you care about the best outcome. And love becomes the greatest measure by which we judge all Christian morality. So the Bible tells us, for example, um, to give generously, right? And that's a good thing we should give. But what if it's your brother and your brother's an addict? Do you give him money? Is that a loving thing to do? No, that's enabling. You're actually causing him harm. It's not a loving thing to do. And it's in a way a little cowardly. You're afraid to confront the addiction of your brother by giving him money. So the loving thing to do is to withhold the money, but to give a big hug and to help your brother or sister get on the road to recovery and to walk with them. That's caring about where their life is going. Huh? The Bible tells us to turn the other cheek, and that's true. So does that mean love is never violent? Hardly. Love is one of the most violent things there is. If you've ever had love in your life, you know it can get... It can get violent, huh? But there are scenarios in which love means you care about what's going to happen to this person. What if you don't have feelings for someone? Can you love them? Absolutely. I remember once a guy told me a story about how he was caring for his mom. And he'd been caring for her for years. And he was beginning to resent, resent her and resent where he was. And he was getting disappointed. And I said to him, but you continue to care for her. And, he, and I said, yeah. I said, do you say mean things or do nasty things to her? He said, no, I'm always taking care of her. I'm like, then you love your mom. Love is what you do and what you say. Love is not what you feel. And in fact, there's something really courageous about being faithful to care for someone in spite of the anger, resentment, exhaustion you might feel in the midst of that. Can I get an amen? amen. So Christian love is not a feeling. Christian love doesn't mean you're a doormat. And, and Christian love trumps every command in the Bible. That if what you're doing is not loving, it's not Christian. Because God is love. Amen? So, Christian love at its heart means to care, particularly for the outcome of the individual. And Christian love is proactive and empathetic. And that is you. You are, you are proactive and empathetic. You're not reactive. You're not angry. You're not judging. And yet you have principles. You have boundaries. You speak your mind, and sometimes you get angry, and that's okay. That doesn't mean you're not a loving person. In fact, loving people sometimes are the most angry because they refuse to give up on people. The anger is their passion that they feel for the people they love. Can I get an amen from angry people? Amen. 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 We don't want to be angry, but we don't want to turn our anger to shame either, right? So your love is proactive. Proactive love means it's brave. 
It means that it's not afraid of getting hurt. It's not afraid of messing up, because it will mess up. It's not afraid of reaching out. And whether it's romantic love or friend love or whatever, whatever kind of love it is, love is brave. And it requires courage because there's so much risk. We're, we're risking fear of abandonment, fear, fear of rejection, right? And, and so to reach out to love other people, to love a stranger, to love someone in need, it requires uh, courage. And you are so brave. Your love is brave. Your love is courageous. Your love is proactive. And that's a good thing. I... I Example of this, I remember when there was this girl I was so into uh, in high school for a long time, many years. You probably, you probably heard me tell this story. Her name was Hannah Presley, and she was dating some guy, and then she broke up with the guy, and then I moved away, and then I came back, and then there was this weird thing where I was like very tepidly like not seeking out this girl because I didn't, you know, it was like, and then I remember I was like, I'm just going to go for it. I, I'm going to just put all my cards on the table. And I remember when we were getting to know each other, I said, I will come out to your brother's wedding if you give me either the, fir the first dance or the last dance. And this was, her answer was so great. She said, I'll give you both. Whoa! Oh, yes! Ba ba ba! That's what I'm talking about. Yeah! First flight out. Orange County to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was at that wedding. And uh, it was funny because we danced and there were other guys who were there. Uh, there's the picture. There were other guys there who wanted to dance with her and I would kind of stand back and let them and they wouldn't ask. And I feel like so many guys my age in college have gotten so wimpy. They don't ask girls to dance. They don't ask girls for numbers even though they like them. They don't tell girls they love them because they're scared. So if you're a young guy, man up. Be a man. Girls want men. Okay. Can I get an amen from girls? All right. Yeah. Okay. I don't look like a man there, but <laughs> I'm only 18, so is she. And we were, weren't even dating. We were just happened to be there at the same time. We took this picture together, not knowing we'd be married three years later, two years later. Anyway, it's so cute. So uh, love, is, love is brave, right? And whether it's romantic love or friends or loving anyone, it requires courage. It requires reaching out and doing very often what's uncomfortable. Maybe God's calling you to love someone in your life. Maybe it's your spouse. God can make you fall in love with your spouse again. Maybe God's asking you to date again after a bad divorce. God wants you to have love in your life. Maybe you had a falling out with a dear friend and you want to rekindle with them. Or maybe you need a new friend, but you're afraid to be vulnerable again. God wants you to have dear friends in your life. Love is brave. It's proactive. It's not afraid of reaching out. And that's who you are. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of how brave you've been, how brave you are. And, I'm, and I'm, I know you're not going to give up in your search for deep friendships and your, your need to care for those who are in need. I'm so, so proud of you. So proud of how you've cared for your kids, or those who've needed you, so proud of you guys. Lo love is proactive. That's what Jesus did. You know, Jesus was the first disciple that was going to disciples. He was recruiting disciples. He didn't have them come to him like everybody else. So follow the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit of God. And if the Holy Spirit nudges you to, to share your faith with someone, or to pray with someone, or to, or to hear from someone, listen to that. Be brave. Be proactive in your love. And you are. And I'm so proud of you. So love is proactive, and love is empathetic. Love is empathetic. Empathy is medicine for the soul. The word empathy means that you feel what somebody else feels, or it's like you walk in that person's shoes. You use your imagination to, to, to really feel what that person's feeling and then say how that would feel in your own words. I know I am one of the most enthusiastic guys, positive guys you'll ever meet. But one of the things I had to learn as a pastor is that very often when people were hurting and they'd come to me, I'd want to encourage them out of it. Pastor, I'm suffering. And I'd say, it's okay, you're going to be great. Things are going to be all right. And sometimes it's good, but a lot of times that feels like rejecting the person's suffering. Or it feels like I'm trying to fix it. I think if you're an encouraging person, positive person like me, be encouraging, say encouraging things, but do it spontaneously, not reacting to somebody's suffering. So always say, hey, you look good today, or I'm thankful for you, or you're going to do great in life. Those are good things to say, unless a person says, I'm really suffering. Ironically, 
if you try and encourage someone who tells you they're suffering, it's like you diminish their suffering and push them away. If you acknowledge their suffering and just be a quiet, loving presence or hug them, or don't say anything at all, but even in your face, show that you feel what they're feeling, that gives them energy. That gives them strength to endure. Sometimes if you've gone through depression or you've gone through just a rough patch of life, sometimes you just need somebody to sit there and be a quiet, loving presence. Somebody that's not going to leave you while you're hurting. Somebody that's not going to say passively, get better, be more comfortable to be around, right? So when you empathize with someone, it's like saying, I know you're suffering and it's okay to be with me right now. I want to be with you while you're hurting. And to know you're not alone in your suffering is, is, is so energizing and life-giving and important if you want to experience life. And that's, that's your love. The, your Christian love is the kind of love that seeks to understand before it judges. Seeks to feel the pain of other people so that they don't have to feel it alone. You are an empathetic, loving person, and I'm, I'm proud of you for that. You, you've decided to give people a piece of your heart before you give them a piece of your mind. You've decided to be the kind of person that doesn't always have to fix everything, but can be present with the messy people in your life and let them know that you're not going to abandon them just because they've messed up a few times. And that's why people feel safe around you. And that's why people are drawn to you. And that's a very good thing. Empathy is medicine for the soul. I remember Hannah and I, you know, our son Cohen has gone through a lot. He's doing much better, by the way. It's been over a year since he's had, about a year since he's had a seizure, which is great. And he's, he's a little delayed, which is not great. But we, we are happy for that. But I remember, I remember once when he was going through a rough time and Chad and I were flying to Israel. And we landed in Newark, New Jersey. And both of our phones, you know, right when we landed, filled with texts and voicemails that Cohen had almost died. So when Hannah found him, she thought he was dead. She had total trauma. She was like, she's still recu recouping from the pain of that one experience. So they gave me a free ticket back home. But it was at 5 in the morning. So I had about five or six hours, and I decided, OK, I'm going to try and get some sleep. I, the only motel that had a room w near the airport, I went there. It was the jankiest thing. There was a big pile of trash in the, in the thing. I'm walking back to my motel room. I walk by this like, gang of guys walking by who are not looking at me in a friendly way. I, my room is under a stairwell. There's a prostitute smoking on it. And I go into my room, and like there's cracks on the walls, and it's I don't know if it's clean. I lay in the bed, and it looks like the worst night of my life. You know, I don't know if my kid's OK. I don't know if my wife's OK. I don't sleep at all. It's, I lay there for about two hours, and I realize it's 3 in the morning. I haven't slept at all. I just, OK, I'm just going to go to the airport. Go back to the airport and I fly home. And my mind is totally on Cohen and Hannah. I'm thinking about them, I walk into the hospital. And the first person I see is my sister-in-law, Bonnie. And she is one of the most loving, serving people and she comes up to me, and she just gives me this big hug. And she says something like, you have been through so much. You came all the way back, and all the things you've gone through, I'm so sorry you're going through, my, through so much. I can't imagine what you've been through. And it was weird because, one, I hadn't really thought about how rough it was for me, even though it was. But when she said that, not only did I recognize that, but I, it, it pulled this, it's weird, it like, to just have my suffering recognized and hugged out. It's like it didn't make it better, but it gave me the strength to carry on and be there for Hannah and Cohen in the way I needed to be. See, that's what empathy does. Empathy, it, do, it doesn't require much. It just requires seeing that the people you love are hurting and just saying it. And there's something about that kind of caring it's like it draws a poison out. It can even be a little, it can sting a little bit. It's like pulling a splinter out. It's so good. And that's who you are. You know, this church is so full of people that are so loving. And I just want to say I'm so grateful for you in particular. You, you have not given up on people. That when people are hurting, you've learned what it means to, to imagine what it's like to be in their shoes. To not leave them because they messed up or fallen. But to, to, to hold out with people and walk with people and never give up on them especially the ones who love you. And I'm so grateful for you. Christian love is proactive. It's empathetic. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to love others. 
Don't be afraid to keep boundaries. Don't be afraid to open your heart to new people um, and to love others. And God's going to do a great thing in your life, in your friendships, in your marriage, in your relationships. God's going to do good things. If you keep acting with faith, with empathy, seeking to understand and being proactive, and that's who you are. I'm so proud of you, and, and I love you. Let's pray. Father, we only love others because you loved us first. How you've loved us and lavished us with so many blessings, we are so grateful. I pray, Lord, that you continue to galvanize, strengthen, reinforce the love we have for one another. Help us to love the stranger, to love the enemy, to love those who persecute us and hate us, and help us to love our friends, our spouses, um, our, our church members, the, the people in our life that care for us. Lord, we thank you that you give us everything we need to be your loving people. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. Thanks for watching our power and your support to us. In the book of Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The greatest human need is to love others and to be loved. To understand love truly is to understand what life is all about. Today, Pastor Bobby Schiller talks about love, and he particularly shares on what Christian love is. Christian love is the kind of love we really need. In the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Christian love is proactive. It is empathetic and caring. Pastor Bobby Schiller uses the story of the Good Samaritan to teach us the golden rules. Love your neighbor as yourself. Lord Jesus took on himself the nature of a man to know our pain, to know our suffering, to die on the cross and to cleanse our sin and conquer death. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Because of the example of Lord Jesus, who showed us what Christian love is, that we can love our neighbors, our friends, and even our enemies or competitors. Christian love does not walk away when being offended. Christian love seeks to understand. Christian love does not cut people out when there is anger or disagreement. Christian love means we care. So let's be brave to love. We love because God loved us first. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. We have good news for you. With effects from January the 6th, 2018, the broadcast time of Our Power on TBB Pearl Channel, every Sunday changed to 8 a.m. in the morning, and every Saturday continue at 10 a.m. in the morning. 
stay tuned. And you can also watch online simultaneously on www.ourpower.org.hk or my TV Super. Thanks for joining. God loves you and see you next week on TV Prepare.